Eureka! Man, that woke you up, didn't it? You've probably heard the word before, and some folks might associate that with a, well, with a TV series that was popular on Sci-Fi Channel a few years back, but I show my age because the first time I heard that word was when I read a story about the ancient Greek scholar Archimedes. Now, if I don't know if you remember that. If you do, you're probably, like myself, older than we care to admit. I learned the story when I was very young, and it always stuck with me for some reason. Now, if you don't know it, the story is that Archimedes reportedly shouted out Eureka when he stepped into the bathtub and saw the water rise. Now, normally that wouldn't sound like anything all that exciting, except for the fact that Archimedes was trying to work out a mathematical problem, how to easily measure the volume of an irregularly shaped object. And he wasn't having any luck. But suddenly he understood that the volume of water displaced by the part of his body that had been submerged would be equal. So now he could measure the volume of anything irregular by just simply measuring how far up the water rose and the volume of the water would be easy to measure. And the story is that he was so excited to discover this that he jumped out of the bathtub and ran naked down the streets of Syracuse. <laughs> Not New York, in Greece, but just by the way. Archimedes' discovery is considered one of the world's great epiphanies. The word epiphany is not strictly a religious or Christian term. It's an ancient Greek word that means sudden, striking revelation. I said earlier, today I think they call it a face plant. Oh, I understand now. Great. Generally, the terms used to describe a breakthrough of scientific, religious, or philosophical discoveries but it can apply to any situation in which you suddenly seem to understand what's been grasping out of your grasp for so long. And you get a new and deeper perspective. For Christians, Epiphany is the celebration of Jesus Christ being revealed to the Gentiles. And that's the non-Jewish folk for all of you, in case you've forgotten. And it's done through the Magi, or wise men. Now, there are all kinds of stories and traditions associated with the visit of the Magi, like what their names are, how many there were, or calling them kings. But what we're told is actually a very simple story. Magi suddenly appear in Jerusalem having traveled from the east. Now, the term magi was generally considered to refer to Zoroastrian priests from Babylonia. Now, what I think is most ex interesting about that is, first of all, Zoroastrianism was one of the world's oldest religions. It's a monotheistic religion, believing only in one God, which was unusual in those days. And not only that, it came from the land of Persia, or modern-day Iran. Think about that. Someone claiming to proclaim the news of there's a new king of the Jews coming from Iran. Today, that would be really spectacular. Honestly, though, these magi who are supposed to have special knowledge seem more like absent-minded professors. They're so intent on following the star as they go along that they tend to forget what they're doing. They show up in Jerusalem saying, where's the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and we've come to honor him. Now, any normal person in those days would have been more than aware of what they were saying and who they were saying it to. I don't know if the Magi went directly to King Herod's palace or if they just started asking in the streets. But that was not a question that someone living in Judea would have asked out loud. Herod, or Herod the Great as he liked to call himself, had been instrumental in bringing the Roman Empire even more fully into Judea. Descendants of the Maccabees had been ruling Judea for quite a while with the approval of the Romans. But a civil war broke out that Herod's family was on the losing side. And so Herod went to Rome to get the empire's help. He had some friends in high places, as they say. And the Roman Senate declared Herod king of the Jews. And so Roman troops went back with Herod to install him as king, and then they got the occupation. And, well, we know the rest of the story. So there was Herod. And the problem is that Herod was, well, according to scholars, they're pretty sure that Herod suffered from depression and paranoia. If you'd like proof of that... Well, Herod assumed that his family was conspiring against him, and over the years, a couple of brothers-in-law, 
a sister-in-law, a mother-in-law, one of his wives, and three of his sons were executed and murdered. Because you can't trust family. <laughs> Fries, turners, just keep that in mind. <laughs> Big families, you know how that is. But here is Herod, the king of the Jews, being asked by the Magi, where's the newborn king of the Jews? And there's some divine sign that's there to back up the claim. It's no surprise that the rest of the story that comes after today's gospel reading says, when Herod knew the Magi had fooled him, he grew very angry. He sent soldiers to kill all the male children in Bethlehem in all the surrounding territory who were two years old and younger, according to the time that he learned from the Magi. Now, some historians will tell you they found no evidence of the incident, and so it couldn't possibly be true. But there's another simpler reason why it's very possible that this happened. The population of Bethlehem at the time was about 1,000. The number of infants in that age range is expected to have been about 20. Now, it would have been a horrible act, but really killing 20 infants would not have been much in the way of what Herod had done. And it wouldn't have drawn much attention compared to all the other terrible deeds he did. And according to Matthew's gospel, it wasn't just Herod that was upset by the news, but all of Jerusalem. Really? All of Jerusalem? How did they all find out? I know the gossip chain's pretty good, but it helps to know that when Matthew's referring to Jerusalem, especially all of Jerusalem, he's referring to the Jewish leadership. Similar when you turn on newscast today and they talk about what's happening in Washington or Presbyterians when we talk about what's going on in Louisville, the headquarters of the PCUSA. All of Jerusalem would probably mean all the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, anyone who was considered part of the religious leadership. And they would have had good reason to be concerned. Because after all, if a new king of the Jews had been born, it wasn't only Herod who was in trouble but the religious leaders. If a new king was born, especially one in the Davidic line, and it happened in ways that fulfilled the prophecies of the Hebrew Scriptures, that king would have had religious authority well beyond anything they could claim. So Herod and all of Jerusalem, all those who were disturbed by the news, really missed out on something important. They were so concerned about holding on to their own power and authority that they missed out on the great joy that this news should have brought them. The Magi, the learned men from the East, weren't Jews. And they weren't part of that tradition. Yet however they gained their knowledge, they saw this birth as a reason to celebrate. A star had been their guide, something only possible if the one who created the stars had a hand in it. The Magi recognized that God was involved in this event. They got it. Now, when Sue and I lived in New Jersey, they had television ads on the time for a, something called Verizon Fios, which is kind of like Spectrum or Google Fiber TV. And they used this phrase that I always enjoyed in their ads that said, it's not about getting Fios, it's about getting Fios. They used the word get in two of its definitions to get something as to come in possession of, and to get something as to gain understanding of. Herod and the religious leaders got the news of the Jesus' birth, but they didn't get the news of Jesus' birth. And honestly, it still happens today. There are many people, some of them good churchgoers, who receive the good news of the gospel, but they don't get the good news of the gospel. They can read the stories, and the letters of the Bible, they may even be able to quote Scripture in a moment's notice or tell you exactly where something comes from if you mention a piece of Scripture. But reading is not understanding. Personally, when I am reading Scripture out loud, I often end with the phrase, may God bless our hearing and our understanding of the words of Scripture. Hearing is not enough unless it's accompanied by understanding. And too often, I think, people fixate on what God has done for them in their personal lives, in their personal relationship with God. Now, I don't deny that God has an impact on our lives, especially personally. 
But I think it's kind of like describing a parent in terms of how they deal with one children when they have multiple children. Often a parent has to do things for the good of the entire family. Now my son and daughter have considered that we have both wounded them mightily by moving them in their senior years of high school. We like to tell them we do it for the good of the entire family. If you based it on that one event, well, you might think we we're cruel parents. But that's not the way it works, nor does it work that way with God. I think we miss a fuller understanding of who God is and our relationship with God if we don't look and see what God does for the entire community, for all of his children, not just one people. If you think about it, the Jews were so excited because they were waiting for a Messiah that was going to take care of them, them personally, that would right the wrongs that had been done to the Jewish people, that they would have their nation restored. It was about what God was going to do for them. But in his letter to the Colossians, Paul told those early Christians they should strive for compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Those are not qualities of something that happens on their own. You know, you can't be compassionate unless you're compassionate to another person. You can't be patient just out of the clear blue sky unless you're being patient in situations and with other people. Those are qualities you only have in relationship with others. Paul also called on them to be tolerant with each other and to forgive each other. You know, oftentimes it's really easy to forgive somebody if you don't ever have to see them again. But if you have to see somebody on a daily basis and you have to forgive them for something, that's forgiveness. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he says, he gets it. He understands how God has revealed to him that it's not just the Jews, but everyone was included in the promises of God in Jesus Christ. That all people would know the love of God. That the story of the Messiah coming to right wrongs wasn't just for the Jews, but it was for all people. And yet there are so many people that insist that God works in different ways. That God withholds favors from one people and not another. That God protects some people and not others. That God loves some people and not others. There's nothing that drives me crazier than when I see an athlete say, I want to thank God for making it possible for me to win today. As if God had money riding on his team. God's going, well, you know, unless the Cowboys win, I'm out. So, you know, <laughs> Seahawks, you're just out of luck. And we better hope he's on the chief side next week. Those same people think it's okay to, for Christians to love some people, but not others. That it's okay for us to show love to some people, but discriminate against others. That it's okay to commit horrible acts in the name of God, but then to turn around and condemn others when they do the exact same thing. I believe those Christians have heard the gospel. They've heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And they've heard about the need for love, compassion, acts of kindness, and care for those in need. They got the information. They just don't get it. Now, like Paul, and like most of us, I have my own share of frailties to deal with, my own prejudices, my own impatience, my own needs that get in the way of living out the gospel. But every now and then, I like to think the good news breaks through the personal walls that I've built up. And I'm reminded that the love of God showed to the world through Jesus Christ is worth trying to live out for everyone. How much difference it can really make to the world if you possibly show love and compassion to everyone, even those people we don't like. If you remember right, Jesus emphasized over and over again we were to love our enemies. He used examples of people like the Samaritans that the Jews just did not want to have anything to do with, saying these are the people you love. These are the people worthy of love. And they're also the people that will show you love. What a difference it could make if we could ever really understand that. What would happen if we all not only got the message of Jesus Christ, but we got the message? Amen.